Welcome to this, the second series of Torch Princeton University Press uh, lectures on European history and culture. They're happening here in Oxford as a collaboration between Torch, the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities, uh, of which I'm the director, I'm Wes Williams, I'm a professor in French uh, literature, which gives me all the more pleasure to be introducing today Professor William Marx from the Professor of Comparative Literature at the Collège de France, who will, as you know, be leading us through some thoughts concerning libraries of the mind. These lectures are happening in Oxford, as I say, partly because Princeton University Press's European headquarters have, since 2021, been here in Oxford at 99 Banbury Road, and they've partnered with Torch, which is a hub for intellectual collaboration and cross-disciplinary research based at the humanities here at the University of Oxford. Before I hand over to Professor Marx again, just a few words of introduction. Um, and I'm repeating this from, yet, from uh, Tuesday for those who were on Tuesday, because uh, as you will have noticed, these lectures are also being filmed uh, and will be on YouTube. The questions, however, which will follow after the lecture, and Professor Marx has generally, generously offered to answer questions, are not being filmed or recorded. So they give us, if you like, a freer space for, for discussion. William Marx, as I said on Tuesday, is no stranger to visiting professorships, having held quite a few across the world. And his work likewise crosses the world, crosses boundaries and borders, as it addresses the status and value of what we call literature from antiquity to the present day and across a range of cultures. His focus today, as you can see, uh, actually, you can't see from this, but it's on libraries of the mind, it's all right, will be on the dark matter of literature. So this is the second of three lectures. There will also be, uh, on Friday, a discussion between Professor Marx and Professor Anne Jefferson, which explores um, Professor Marx's work across his uh, life as a writer, as a critic, um, looking at the writing life, building on uh, an early book, La Vie, la vie d'un Erudit, looking also at the hatred of literature, la haine de la literature, um, and also perhaps a few questions or a few thoughts about his most recent book, The Tomb of Oedipus, Why Greek Tragedies Were Not Tragic, which as a number of people have said to me, has a great cover. Um, you included the cover in your first lecture, I think, uh, at least in the translation, um, and which argues a range of questions about the reception of Greek tragedy, but also how we might misunderstand texts of the past, as well as genres um, with which we work. As I say, his own writing life and the questions that his boundary crossing work raises will then be the subject of a lunchtime conversation with Anne Jefferson on Friday in Torch, to which you're all very welcome with the added bonus of sandwiches. So it starts at 12.30, there'll be sandwiches and drinks and so on, um, and the discussion proper will start around at 12.45, 1 o'clock. All are warmly welcome. You're also very welcome here today, and without further ado, I'll hand over to Professor William Marks. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Wes, for this very nice and kind introduction, and also for the, of course, for the invitation. And thank you... Uh, all of you for, I mean, coming back. I think it's, uh, it's something that is uh, more difficult sometimes than coming for the first time. So I'm happy that you that you are still um, there. And welcome to this. Uh, can you hear me well? It's okay. Okay. And welcome to this uh, uh, second lecture in the second series of the Princeton University Press lectures. And remember that we are also in the, uh, 2022. So there are a lot of tools there. And uh, so, I mean, it's a second in second, so I mean, maybe there's a sign there. Uh, we'll see. So, the title of this second lecture is uh, The Dark Matter of uh, Literature. And we are still exploring, we still explore, of course, still exploring the problem of uh, libraries of the mind with the problem of the dark matter of uh, literature. So, first I will start with a few words about what dark matter is, not in literature, but in space, in universe. First, uh, 
dark matter should not be confused with black holes. Uh, sometimes they are confused together. It's that there are two things completely uh, different. So, what is dark matter in the cosmos? Well, actually, I, I do not know. <laughs> I do not know, and actually, nobody knows. Nobody knows what dark matter is. And actually, this isn't dark matter. <laughs> it isn't a black hole it, either. It isn't dark matter. It's just, uh, it's just the Crab Nebula. It's a very beautiful picture uh, taken by the Hubble uh, Space uh, Telescope. So I put that picture here because it's a very nice uh, image, but it is it is an, it has nothing to do with dark matter. Um, but it can, if I could show you dark matter, I think I would get the Nobel Prize in physics. And so we do not know what dark matter is, but we know that it is there in the space somewhere. We know it is there because the existence of dark matter is made necessary by our current equations about the universe. Galaxies evolve as they do. I mean, stars move as we see them do precisely, precisely because there is this dark matter somewhere, maybe everywhere, whose exact nature is unknown, but whose existence astronomers postulate because dark matter has effects on visible objects. So we must absolutely postulate the existence uh, of dark matter, but we don't know what kind of particle it is. So nobody observed, observed it. So my proposition is this. There is dark matter in space, but there is also dark matter in literature as well as in space. That is to say, there is the diffuse but invisible presence of a material, a material whose existence can only be guessed indirectly by the effects that this invisible matter produces on visible matter. So, for literature, what is the visible matter of literature? The visible matter is the works. The works we know, and I have talked about them uh, in the first lecture, and it's also the system those works form between them. I mean, the one among, I mean, in relation with the others. But Actually, the logic, the logic of this system of literature is not always apparent as it should be because precisely of the existence of this dark matter of literature, because of the existence of invisible works, invisible works which form something like the background of the visible works of literature, of the works that are known to us. If you think of the system, about the system of literature, it raises actually many, many questions. And maybe three questions. First, there is the question of transmission. Uh, why do we have the works we have, I mean, in our libraries, in our physical libraries, and why do we not have other works? This is the question of transmission. Second, there is a question of context. Do we always know what these works we have refer to? I mean, what do the works we have refer to? That's the question of context. And third question, why do we know why and how these uh, works were created? And this is the question of origin. Well, the hypothesis of dark matter is a way to answer these uh, fundamental questions about the system of literature. But in um, literature, we are a little happier than in astronomy. 
In astronomy, indeed, the nature of dark matter, the celestial dark matter, is unknown, as I told you. But in literature, we know what dark matter is. This dark matter of literature is composed essentially of works, but different works from those works we have. And we could divide this dark matter of literature into, into three different categories. And here they are. Three types of dark matter. You have first the lost works, who could which could answer the question of transmission. Then there are the neglected works, which answer in many ways the question of context. And we have, last, the transformed works, which uh, answer the question of origin. So we need to postulate this kind of dark matter of literature in our own mental libraries, in our libraries of the mind. So let us explore briefly those different types of dark matter. So the lost works. The lost works, I mean by that, works that have not been transmitted to us, that we do not have in our uh, physical uh, libraries. Because, and I said a word about this uh, in my first lecture, it is not possible to transmit everything that has been uh, written. And actually, for centuries, transmission was only possible by forgetting other works, by losing those works, because loss is the condition of memory. That's actually what neuroscientists say about, about how memory in the brain works. So it's by losing some, uh, some neurons. So, so that's how, how it works. So what are those lost works that are necessary for our memories? Well, first, there are the works completely lost. I mean, the works of which all trace is lost, all memory even is lost of them. So those works of which one ignores if they ever existed, those of which no trace, absolutely no trace, no testimony, even indirect, exists. Um, actually, of these totally, completely lost works, you cannot say anything positive, of course. One can only make suppositions, or we could make one's, our imagination wander. Let's, let us think of men of Neanderthal. Maybe th there were bards among men of Neanderthals. So if a Neanderthal bard sang about mammoths, if this song had had some success in his community, or her community, why? Maybe she was female. If it was, if that song was transmitted over a few generations, well, it is possible, but um, we will never know. So that's a problem. We could take a more recent uh, hypothesis. Uh, let us take up the famous hypothesis of Virginia Woolf in a room of one's own. This is very famous. The hypothesis of William Shakespeare's sister. So, if a sister of Shakespeare existed and wrote a tragedy of her brother's caliber, actually we will never know because no trace of the work or of the author or of the writer has survived for, for, uh, for causes that Virginia Woolf explains in her text. But actually, maybe a sister of Shakespeare existed. Why not? So it is an act of epistemological modesty to make this hypothesis and other hypotheses, of course, and to imagine which works could have disappeared and which could possibly make sense with those works we have preserved. Actually, we must always be ready to imagine the almost infinite extent of the disappearance of works, even if 
this awareness is very unsettling. So we must always imagine our ignorance as being much greater than we could ever imagine. But oh, that is about the works completely lost. But sometimes the lost works have left a little more substance in our memory. And those are the works of which there is some reflection somewhere. And so this reflection can be just a minimal memory, sometimes a simple mention somewhere, a title, or maybe a, the lost model of other works. Or in the best case, we have sometimes a summary of that uh, lost works, lost work. Often it is just a title, but sometimes it's, it is even less than the title. It's the, it's the presence, very elusive. For, for instance, the, the dialogues of Aristotle. Well, I say the dialogues of Aristotle, but we never read any dialogues by Aristotle. But we know they existed. We know that they are, they are totally lost. We know that they existed. They existed because Cicero prays, praises those dialogues on several occasions, and they served as a model for Cicero's own philosophical dialogues. And for Cicero's, they were Aristotle's uh, masterworks, actually. But we have completely lost them. Or, or we know, of course, the great historical sums of antiquity, of which we have preserved summaries. The historical library of Diodorus of Sicily was composed in the first century, and it was universal history in 40 books, and only 15 of them remain now. And actually, this uh, historical library of D Diodorus of Sicily was itself the compilation of other historians, Icatius of Abdera, Ctesias of Cnidos, Ephorus, and many, and many others. But we lost, we lost the works of the other historians. We know the library of Patriarch Photius in the ninth uh, century. It's a, it's a list and comments on about 280 works, many of which are lost. And we know those works only by this list and comments by, uh, by Photius. And so the tragedy of this story is that the existence of such compilations has favored the disinterest for the original works, and thus it has favored their disappearance. We could see this phenomenon as something tragic, or on the contrary, as the pragmatic and positive character of the history of works. A work disappears, or we let it disappear, if there is a trace of that work, a summary elsewhere. Because for reasons of economy, economy of paper, economy of parchment, economy of time, I mean copying time and reading time, summaries have been preferred to the original for centuries. And this has caused the loss of the original. And there are also compilations of compilations, such as the Suda. The Suda is a Greek encyclopedia from the end of the uh, 10th century. And it is uh, kind of a very messy dictionary, dictionary of words, dictionary of things, and also an incomparable source of lost texts, which are quoted or used or referred to in the Suda. And so this allows us to move on to the works of which there is something material left, a little more than a simple memory or mention. Those works of which there remains little, even very little substance. So the works of which fragments remain. But beware, be cautious, actually. Often it is better to have a complete summary of a work without a quotation of the work itself to have, it's better to have the complete summary than an isolated quotation, an isolated quote, because a quote doesn't tell much <laughs> by itself. And so we some, 
often we do not know how to make sense of a single quote by a, a work. And we have such quotes, for example, for many tragedies by uh, Aeschylus, Sophocles, or Euripides, and other, other uh, playwrights, of course. So the isolated fragment is often worth less uh, for, for knowledge than the summary uh, or the more global reflection we could have of uh, the work. But sometimes the fragments we have give us the illusion of having the complete work. Actually, you know, uh, or you think you know, uh, Petronius uh, Satyricon. And because you know that extraordinary episode we, we have and which is the center of uh, the work we, we have, that is the, 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 the Feast of Trimalcion. The Feast of Trimalcion. Actually, the Feast of Trimalcion is the main fragment of the bigger novel by uh, Petronius. And actually, the Feast of Trimalcion is the only reason for the survival of the work. I mean, monks have just copied that episode because they felt humored by, by it and it was full of allusions and, 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 and so on. So most of the rest of the novel by Petronius has disappeared. But for us, the satiricon, as we read it, and which seems quite complete, like that, actually is above all the feast of Trimalcion. Well, we are lucky to have at least that, that uh, big and large uh, fragment. And of course, you know also the fragmentary works uh, par excellence, in many ways. Those fragmentary works are the works by ancient philosophers whose complete doctrine we have tried to reconstruct from scattered lines, uh, from quotations made here and there by other philosophers or theologians, Heraclitus, uh, Democritus, Epicurus, etc. All these fragments aroused a lot of dreams and speculations about what was the doctrines be behind, uh, behind those fragments. I cannot resist the pleasure of uh, quoting this uh, excerpt by Paul Valéry in his play, Mont Faust. There is a disciple of Mont Faust. He's in Faust library. He deciphers titles and names in the library. And he sees in that, in that library, I mean, the complete imaginary library, but he sees, I mean, Heraclitus, complete works. Only Faust has a Heraclitus in 10 folio volumes, actually. Actually, you know that all the Heraclitus that we have preserved consists only of a few hundred scattered and mysterious uh, sentences. So actually, I would, I would give a lot to have this edition of the complete works in 10 folio uh, volumes. So that is for the first type of uh, lost works. Let us have a brief look at the second type of lost work, uh, not, not, not of a dark material, dark matter, that is the neglected, the neglected works. For there are those neglected works, that is, works that, unlike the previous ones, the lost works, works that have been transmitted, uh, which exist in our physical libraries, but, but we, we do not pay attention to them for various reasons. Works that exist in real libraries, but are lost in mental libraries, in the libraries of our minds, because we find them, or or, or the people before us, uh, found them less interesting than other works. Because, for instance, they come from authors that, who were judged less interesting than other uh, authors. So we transfer to works, sometimes, social prejudices linked to the authors. So authors belonging to min minorities, to the dominated, to women also, so often were somehow despised and well, those works were not deemed interesting. So those works were neglected. And also it can also be the case for works written in languages 
that are not highly regarded. Those languages which do not participate in the great market of world literature. And so the literatures, the works that come from peoples or from cultures considered secondary, those are neglected too. And so I will come to these kinds of works in my next and last uh, lecture. But there are also the works which are judged uh, less interesting because of their content, because they do not correspond to the direction of the history of literature of war, or of art, because the history of uh, literature is supposed to be progressive, and those works that do not go into the, I mean, the orientation of that history, which are less progressive or seem less progressive than others, well, they are neglected. So, actually, literary history is a great purveyor of uh, neglected work. So it is a, a book I edited a uh, long time ago about those arrière guards works, I mean rear guards works, I mean that do not belong to the main uh, trend of uh, literary, liter literary uh, history. But literary history actually defines dominant aesthetic movements and so, in doing so, it relegates out of the field of the attention quantity of atypical works. I mean, works which belong to the rear guards, uh, because the general vision of the aesthetic history is rather progressive. And so, but those neglected works, all of them, actually would allow us, if we are aware of them, would allow us to answer the question of the context of visible books. Because the books that were written at the time, I mean, they took into account, I mean, their own uh, conception, they took into account those works that now are neglected. So we know, we need to know uh, those uh, neglected works in, in order to understand the works we have in our minds. That's for the neglected works. And then the third type of uh, dark matter, the transformed works. Because there are works that have been merged into other works, works that have been transformed into a later uh, work. Actually, there is a kind of a dialectics between creation and transformation and even destruction. So works, so many works are fused, disappear because they are fused into a later work. The later work occupies the place of the initial work. But what kind of place, what kind of space is reserved to the initial place, to the initial work? Actually, there are several cases. The simplest example would come from the from visual arts, because in visual arts, the place of the, of the initial work is really a physical place, I mean, in the physical sense of the term. So let us take an example, uh, quite nice, I think, um, the case of repaints, uh, what we call repaints on uh, painting. So the corrections made to a painting that was already completed. This is, I don't know if you see it, because it's quite dark and the, 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 the room is, is uh, quite, I mean, there's a lot of light here. But uh, this is beautiful uh, painting by Gustave Courbet, The Wounded Man. It was done uh, during, I mean, in the 1815, uh, 1854, uh, actually. And it is at the Musée uh, d'Orsay in Paris. It is a magnificent self-portrait that Courbet never parted with. But in 1973, an X-ray of the painting was taken. And oh, surprise, with the X-ray, they saw that there was another painting <laughs> behind the main painting. And the X-ray revealed the presence of a woman, woman next to a man, and this time the man has no beard. I mean, let us compare with the, uh, the painting and what we have in the X-ray. 
And actually those, this is a loving couple, or well, maybe just only an X-ray, but it should have been very loving, this image. But actually we have a, we have a preparatory, a preparatory drawing of this painting in the Museum of Besançon. It is called La Sieste Champêtre, and it is dated from 1841. At that time, in 1841, um, Gustave Courbet was having a romance with a woman he loved, Virginie Binet. But Virginie Binet left Courbet ten years later. So he had made that, I mean, this is a preparatory drawing, he had made that uh, uh, painting with her in 1844. But when she left him, ten years later, he was so devastated that he took over the painting of their love and transformed it into the self-portrait of a dying man with a wound in his heart. So, if one must regret the lost love, should we also regret the lost work that went with this lost love? Well, the question, I think, is open. But it is a very significant example of transformed uh, work. But there are also cases where the work is an infinitely reproducible object in music, in literature. In music, a um, famous example is, for instance, um, the fact that Beethoven uh, wrote successively four different overtures uh, for his opera Fidelio. So all four overtures, all four openings are given, and sometimes they are given individually in concerts under the name of Leonore. Leonore I, Leonore II, Leonore III, and, and sometimes they are integrated into the opera at various moments. So, so now the conductors integrate the various uh, overtures at different moments of the, of, the, of the opera. So that's a possibility to uh, get the, the whole, all, all the, the stages of the transformed uh, work. But uh, most of the time, the initial work merges into the final work in an indistinct way. We know that the essays by Montaigne have continued to grow in length over different editions, successive editions. And so the sentences which were commented by Montaigne have uh, proliferated. And when we look at the current complete philological edition. Uh, so the current philological editions generally allow the different strata to be separated. You have letters that show you which edition uh, belongs, I mean, to which edition belongs uh, the, the paragraph you are uh, reading. So theoretically, it is always possible for any reader by a kind of an acrobatic reading to read only the first text of the first edition but but who does except uh, West William so I uh, so I mean except except scholars so so actually the initial work is lost to our, to our attention it does not belong to our library of the of the mind actually often we rather believe that the fullest volume is the best but maybe it is not the case uh, so and sometimes the two moments of creation, initial and final, still exist, but uh, only one, the final work, occupies the whole collective and individual memory. Um, à la recherche du temps perdu by Proust has taken the place of the first draft and what's called Jean Santeuil. Jean Santeuil has been edited, it's possible to read it, but who reads it, actually? I mean, only some specialists. But it is very interesting to see Jean Santel. So, so, actually, we can console ourselves as uh, with what one of the characters in... I mean, today, maybe you know that the, the most famous uh, literary prize in France for novels has been awarded. Uh, but uh, I will give you an example from the last year's uh, Prix Goncourt. Uh, it was a, 
sentence taken from Mohamed Mbougar Sarr, La plus secrète mémoire des hommes, still not translated into English. I suppose it's, I mean, it's in progress because it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful uh, novel. So the most secret memory of man, mankind. You know. uh, well, there is that sentence, which I, it's, 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 it's a wonderful book about writing, about literature, about lost works, actually. And the main character, Uh, writes or says, j'ai toujours pensé que chaque livre que publiait un écrivain n'était que la somme de ceux qu'il avait détruits avant d'en arriver là ou le résultat de tous ceux qu'il s'était retenu d'écrire. I always thought that every book a writer published was the sum of all the books he had destroyed before he got there or the result of all the books he had refrained from writing, from writing. So actually, it is a sweet consolation to think that the existing works are the offspring of the of disappeared uh, works. And this is true, indeed, of some works. So when we think so, we, less, we mourn less the works that have disappeared. But um, thinking that all the disappeared works have metamorphosed into the existing and present works, this can be, in my opinion, only, only the object of a kind of faith, a kind of philosophical faith or conviction, that is kind of a philosophy of history in the manner of Hegel. I mean, I mean it, would be, it would postulate that the present is the result of a dialectical development of the past, an organic development of the past. And so from this point of view, the past would be included in the present. So that's quite reassuring, but are we so sure of that? So I'm not so sure, actually. Well, and actually there, are, there is a subtype, I mean, of uh, the transformed works. It is the subtype of the unrealized works, the unrealized works. That is the fourth category, the unrealized works. So, works that were not written, because they are first of all the works that have been thought, but not written. The works that were projected by a creator, but not realized. So, those unrealized works. These works are not unfinished works, they are not fragmentary works, but they, they are works that have not known strictly any any realization, any beginning of realization on the paper. So they are the stillborn works in the mind of their creator. They are they were they were completely composed in mind, in spirit, but never put on paper. Aborted works, so to speak. Jean-Jacques Rousseau writes about this in the fourth book of the Confessions. It's an extraordinary passage of the Confessions. What I must regret is not having kept, he was young at the time when he, uh, when he talked about this, what I must regret is not having kept a journal of my travels, being conscious that a number of interesting details have slipped my memory. For never did I exist so completely, never live so uh, thoroughly, never was so much myself, if I dare use the expression, as in those journeys made on foot. Walking animates and enlivens my spirits. I can hardly think when I, when in a state of inactivity, my body must be exercised to make my judgment active. The view of a fine country, a succession of agreeable prospects, a free air, a good appetite, and the health I gained by walking, the freedom of ease and the distance from everything that can make me recollect the dependence of my situation, conspire to free my soul and give boldness to my thoughts, throwing me in a manner into the immensity of beings where I combine, choose and appropriate them to my fancy without constraint or fear. I dispose of all nature as I please, my heart wandering from object to object, approximates and units with those that please it and is surrounded by charming images and becomes intoxicated with delicious sensations. And the quotation is quite long, but it is, here is the second and last page. If attempting to render these sensations permanent, 
I am amused in describing to myself what glow of coloring, what energy of expression do I give them. It has been said that all these are to be found in my works, in my later works, though written in the decline of life, of my life. Oh, had those of my early youth been seen, those made during my travels, composed but never written? Why did I not write them, will be asked. And why should I have written them, I may answer. Why deprive myself of the actual charm of my enjoyments to inform others what I enjoyed? What to me were readers, the public, or all the world while I was mounting the Empyrean? Besides, did I carry pens, paper, and ink with me? Had I recollected all this, not a thought would have occurred worth preserving. I do not foresee when I shall have ideas. They come when they please, and not when I call for them. Either they avoid me altogether, or rushing in crowds, overwhelm me with their force and number. Ten volumes a day would not suffice barely to enumerate my thoughts. How then should I find time? to write them. In stopping, I thought of nothing but a hearty dinner. On departing, of nothing but a charming walk. I felt that a new paradise awaited me at the door and eagerly leaped forward to enjoy it. Ah, what a marvelous text, I think. Uh, maybe translation is not so good, but it's better in French. But this text carries within it Although, several, although the text was written several decades after the events reported by Rousseau, I mean, this text carries the joy of the power of uh, uh, creation. Ten volumes a day, he wrote in his mind, says uh, Rousseau. So actually, it would be very necessary to build an invisible library of Rousseau's unwritten works uh, that were written, I mean, that were imagined uh, during his walks. Well, 10 volumes a day, that's a hyperbole, of course. But this hyperbole, hyperbole, I don't know how to say that, says something about the gratuitous debauchery of the creative force. I mean, uh, Actually, writing, says Rousseau, writing ruins the creation drive. It ruins the creating uh, force. So what the text describes is finally somehow like the mental equivalent of onanism. But it is mental onanism. It is an enjoyment of creation for oneself alone. And we know, I mean, in Rousseau's confession, what, I mean, the role of masturbation in his own existence. But there was also that kind of masturba I mean, mental masturbation in, in his mind. But uh, we'd like to, to, we would like to, to, to see what emerged from those uh, works. And finally, there are these, the unrealized works, the works that were not written because the historical conditions or the, for the realization of the work uh, were not met. And I will not recount to you, I mean, the, the same example of William Shakespeare's uh, sister, according to Virginia Woolf. Or we have a lot of, for, for another example, we have a lot of uh, uh, memories, uh, diaries of uh, travelers going to the new world from Europe in the 16th, 17th uh, century and giving their expression. And you know that some some people went the other way around. I mean, from the from the uh, new world to the old world. So, but we don't have those accounts of travelers from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere. Those accounts, those feelings, they were left completely unwritten. So, so, but we must imagine what they were like. So that is uh, my list of different types of uh, dark matter. How to find, actually, how to find or to retrieve this dark matter? Actually, and I said a word already, a word about this, as for unrealized work, unwritten works, 
There is only one method to make those works reappear, that is imagination. But not just any imagination, but an imagination that will be attentive to the gaps, to the holes in history, to the blanks in uh, memory. And it is often the strengths, the strengths of novels to give a voice to those who have not had uh, a voice. For example, let us think of the, the Remains of the Day by Kazuo Ishiguro. Uh, the voice here is given to an English butler of the first half of the 20th century. And, uh, and it, was, it is somebody who would, wouldn't have written anything. But the voice is given here by a Japanese writer of the end of the 20th uh, century. And the ancestor of this technique of imagination of uh, lost voices is the technique of the interior monologue. I mean, what uh, Joyce made, I mean, did in Ulysses or Virginia Woolf with uh, Mrs. Dalloway. So the voice given to those who do not write. Uh, and so, and the ancestor of the interior monologue is the technique of the literary technique of the internal focus, the point of view, the technique of the point of view, what Flaubert used with Madame Bovary. Madame Bovary is a story of life of a country bourgeois woman who has no voice as a writer, but, but she has a voice as a, as a reader because she reads. And so we have her feelings with uh, uh, Flaubert's novel. Or even earlier, La Princesse de Clève by Madame de Lafayette. And it is somehow the voice given to the sentimental condition and the constraints exerted on a woman of the aristocracy. She's not a bourgeois woman, definitely not. Uh, but, but she, we know, we have some examples maybe of the th thinking by such women that we would not that, that we wouldn't have uh, otherwise, and of course there are also the there is also the counterfactual imagination. I I told you about those travelers from uh, 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 southern hemisphere to uh, northern hemisphere. A few years ago, the French novelist Laurent Binet published a novel called Civilizations, where he imagines uh, that uh, Incas, people from Southern America, uh, colonized Europe. And so in somehow it, uh, it, uh, it is uh, the other, I mean, it's very counterfactual, but it's a way to give voice to people I mean, whose works we do not know. But sometimes we can make the effort by studying their language and their writing to, to, to see what they, to, what they really uh, thought. So imagination is very, uh, very interesting to find unrealized works. For transformed works, works that have been transformed, well, philology is there. And a special kind of philology, genetic criticism, I mean, criticism of the genesis of works, uh, the study of manuscripts and, and of drafts by, by writers. I won't say anything about this. It is a, maybe a whole, I mean, there is a, whole discipline, I mean, philology, behind, behind, behind this. For the neglected works, there is, uh, what I propose is, th that is the works that still exist somewhere in libraries, in archives, there is an obvious solution, and the solution is the conversion, conversion of the gaze. We must take an interest in these forgotten works, these works of women authors, women composers, for example, but not only. Works of neglected periods, works of neglected genres, of neglected civilizations, of neglected languages. We must make them come back to our memory. They undoubtedly have many things to teach us, many new pleasures uh, they could give us too. But uh, this conversion of the gaze has also the risk of divert us from the visible matter, from the visible literature, the literature we, we have already in our minds. And so it is necessary, of course, to increase the share of the visible. It is necessary to complexify the visible. Uh, it is necessary to increase our mental libraries by seeking other works on the shelves of the real libraries, but we should 
try at least not to not to remove visible matter. Uh, uh, we should not read the the libraries, the existing libraries of the mind. But it is very difficult. <laughs> it is very difficult because as I as I told you before at the, at the start of this lecture, I mean we cannot. Uh, uh, remember something without, I mean, uh, uh, forgetting uh, some other things. So, increasing the libraries without losing works, well, that should be an ideal. It is easier to say than to do. Uh, but our capacities are limited, and so, and not only not only the capacities of the hum of the individual memory, but also the capacities of the collective memory. So. I think we should do our best to increase mental libraries and not to separate, I mean, to, to exclude works. But, well, will it be so? I don't know. I don't know. I hope, I hope we will do our best to increase without losing. So, so much for the neglected works. But what about, what about the completely lost works? Those works of which no trace remains. Is it still possible to do something, not to resurrect them? Sometimes it happens. We know there is that villa of papyri in Herculanum in Italy, where there are, I mean, it's a, the library which contains thousands of scrolls of literature and philosophy, and they have not yet been deciphered because it's very difficult. They are, they are burned scrolls. So it is very difficult to just to unroll them. So when, when you unroll them, basically you destroy them. So, <laughs> so, but there are techniques, but techniques take time. And so, so, but we can expect that for centuries, I mean, the, the scroll will be uh, progressively unrolled. And so we will have those um, unknown and lost uh, works. But that's kind of a miracle. But when we don't have such scrolls, when works are completely lost, completely. So can we have an idea to, to get to know them a little better, to define the outlines of lost works? How could we find out about works that have been completely lost, of which nothing remains? Is there anything to do? Actually, we, oui. yes, we, oui. we, oui. in French, yeah. And there are at least two possible methods. There is the direct method or genealogical method, and there is the indirect uh, method. So let us start with the first one, the genealogical method. So the direct method is what we could call, it's, or, or gen genealogical, consists in starting from the texts we have and inferring from the structure of those texts we have the very process of their composition and inferring the lost texts from which they came. Actually, this started perhaps uh, with the Bible. Uh, uh, biblical exegesis, exegesis, I don't know how to say that, uh, has proceeded since the 18th century and since, in particular, since Jean, uh, Jean Astruc, I mean, this first uh, book we, you have here, Jean Astruc was a former colleague of mine at the Collège de France. Obviously, he was a doctor. Uh, it was a Collège Royal at the time. But he's the first to have distinguished in the Genesis two layers of redaction. You know that there is in the Genesis, in the Hebrew Genesis, I mean, sometimes God is referred to with the word Elohim, which means the gods or deities or the spirits. And there is also, uh, God is referred sometimes to with the proper name, of God, that is uh, the tetragrammaton uh, with the four letters uh, in Hebrew, Yod, He, Wow, He. And so uh, Jean Astruc made the hypothesis that actually there were two kinds of redactions, two redactors, two writers, and they were fused together uh, later. And so this theory has, since that time, undergone, underwent many developments and complexities, and it is still being discussed, but often admitted. Uh, but still, the principle of this uh, biblical genealogy is this. It is to distinguish different strata of text in the text we have, and this allows us to re reconstitute the original texts that were lost. And the French Hellenist Victor 
Bérard did the same thing in his edition of the Odyssey. Uh, he considered whole chapters of the Odyssey as being interpolated. And so he made an edition of the Odyssey where he, I mean, he, he excluded all those chapters, all those, and actually it's completely unusable. I mean, if you want to discover the Odyssey with Victor Berard's edition, it's impossible because what you, when you want to read the Odyssey, you want to read the traditional Odyssey, not the Odyssey by Victor Berard, uh, but because you, you are not supposed maybe to believe, I mean, his own uh, hypothesis. And so, but he tried to, he tried to recompose the original text of the, of the uh, Odyssey. So he has done with Homer what no exegete, uh, no biblical, no theologian has ever done with the Bible, because maybe Homer is less sacred than, than the Bible. So nobody has, I suppose, has made, I mean, an edition of an uh, Eloistic uh, edition of the Bible or Yavist uh, edition of the Bible. So we, we are, all the books of Genesis we have in our Bibles are the traditional Genesis with the two strata of uh, reduction. So nobody dared to butcher the text of the Bible without mercy. Another recent genealogical attempt to, um, to reconstruct um, the sources of our uh, of lost works is made by a re young researcher called Julien Duy in his book Cosmogonies. Uh, Julien Duy, it's very recent, it's one or two years ago, uh, wanted to reconstitute the primitive myths of humanity. Uh, and he used from that the myths existing among all peoples. So he wanted to reconstruct what the primitive humanity uh, has, has myths. And is it possible to make the genealogy of the current myths and to imagine what were the primitive myths. So, he, to do so, Julien Duy uh, used contemporary genomic techniques. I mean, and those techniques make it possible to reconstitute the primitive genetic heritage of humanity from the genomes of today's populations. So, to do this, the researcher gathered all available versions of the myths that interest him, by, for example, the creation of the world. And so he cut each of them into a multitude of elementary narrative segments, myths or narratems, I mean, small units of uh, narration, of narrative. For example, is the earth a feminine being or a masculine being? Is water presented as the original element before the island or is it the other way around? Etc. etc. Et and he codes all of this in a computer as one codes the genome and he applies to this a statistical algorithm and he comes out with a complex family tree like this. Uh, which eventually allows to reconstitute the primitive history of the myths and to locate even its original um, uh, geograph geographical origin. So uh, this research is very exciting, of course, because of its uh, revolutionary method. It has all the appearances of scientific objectivity, but it's Pose, it poses important problems, and those problems should not be neglected. And those problems can be found in all genealogical methods. The problems are of three kinds. Actually, first of all, genealogy assumes that we have a basic material of homogeneous and certain quality. With genomics, it's, it, is, I mean, it is enough to extract genomes from all populations from all current populations. So those genomes really exist and they are attested. But with myths, it's quite different because it's much more complicated. Myths are expressed in different languages. They pose translation problems. They are reported by informants, by ethnologists, by mythographers, by historians, and those have not worked in the same way uh, every, every time. And so they had not used the same methods, so they are not all re reliable. They introduce their own biases into the accounts. So 
this, the homogeneity of the material is very difficult to obtain and to guarantee. The second difficulty is the divisions of the story like this into elementary units. These units correspond to units of meaning and they seem relevant for us today, for a contemporary researcher, but maybe they were not relevant for the peoples who had those myths. For example, is the category of water as an unique element something so obvious for, I mean, pre previous civilization, previous cultures? Maybe is the water we drink, the water of the rain, the water of the rivers, the water of the sea, is it the same concept? for all cultures. I don't know. So we have to think about it. So are we not introducing into our modern representations of the world, I mean, are we not introducing modern representations of the world uh, by cutting up these stories into elementary units? So maybe the idea that we could cut up these stories into elementary units is also a modern postulate. So. That's, that's a problem. And the third difficulty is the difficulty of the algorithm you use. Because uh, this algorithm comes from genomic. And is it really valid for the genealogy of myths? That is a question. Actually, any algorithm, actually, there are many algorithms for genomics, <laughs> and they are competing among each other. So, any algorithm you use, whatever the elements you put into the computer will give you a genealogical tree. But it doesn't mean that the genealogical tree is true. So uh, it is very, I mean, it is very attracting, but it's, sometimes it's just an illusion. So I think, well, those difficulties are real, but it does not necessarily invalidate the conclusions of the researcher here. I think it's a stimulating proposal and well, this kind of research should be maybe encouraged and with other people and uh, with uh, maybe, uh, and maybe with time we'll have uh, results that will be validated. But the main problem of the genealogical or direct method of finding lost works is the quality of the existing material. So uh, the lost work will only be in the best on cases with this kind of genealogy the work that has generated the work that exists. So the one work, the work from which descendants remain. But if lost works have created no other works that are themselves, and if the descendants are lost themselves, so what can be done? Nothing with the genealogical method. So we are very dependent on the descendants of lost works to reconstruct, if, if possible, the uh, lost works. So, uh, on the contrary, there are chances that the lost works that have left no descendants are the ones that would be the most interactive, instructive for us, because they would be most different from what we know. So, we could use another method. And the method here is the indirect method. The Indirect method consists of questioning, in questioning the very mechanisms of the loss. In co it consists in cal calculating what is missing from what remains. It is an interrogation on the negative in our physical libraries. And two examples of this method could be given. This, uh, the first example is very recent and concerns Arthurian novels. It is a work, an article published in science. It is quite rare to have in science research in literature, and especially medieval literature. But it is a research which associates statisticians and specialists in medieval literature from different universities in Antwerp, Amsterdam, and Taiwan. And the hypothesis consists in applying to the diffusion of works in medieval manuscripts the same calculation techniques uh, that are used for the evaluation of the number of unknown plant and animal species and to uh, assess this number of species, of unknown species, from the number we, of specimens we have of known species. Biologists do that every time. I mean, they, they calculate the number of unknown species from the number of animals they have in nature. Could we do the same with manuscripts and Arthurian romances? That's what those researchers did. 
So Arthurian novels are assimilated to biological species, and the manuscripts in which those uh, novels appear are assimilated to specimen, specimens of the species. So, roughly speaking, I will. This is very a simplistic expl explanation of their method, but it's much more complicated. So they draw a curve, those, uh, those uh, researchers. So each Arthurian novel is situated according to the number of manuscripts in which it is copied. Let us take an example. It will be, it will be uh, simpler. So imagine that we have, yes, you know, here you have 10 novels, okay? Ten, this is the column, the, the column of novels, and in row is the number of manuscripts. So you, you know that you have 10 Arthurian novels that are present each in three manuscripts across Europe. Okay. You have 10 novels present, each one is present in three manuscripts. You also know that you have 20 novels that are present into only two manuscripts across uh, European libraries. And you have 30 novels that are present only in one manuscript. So only one manuscript is a testimony to the existence of each of these novels. So we can, you could draw a line and then you could infer, make the hypothesis that, that, that there is at least, there are at least, or approximately, 40 novels that are present in no manuscripts at all. And a novel that is present in no manuscript at all is a lost novel, actually, because you don't have those novels. So we can imagine that there are 40 lost novels, if there is that kind of uh, uh, calculation. Okay? This is a very simple example. Of course, the calculations those researchers did is much more complicated. Uh, but it, basically, it, it's this. And so they found, they demonstrated, that actually 32% of Arthurian novels have disappeared. And there are different rates depending on languages. There are 47% of French novels, 20% of German novels, and 60% of English novels, actually. Actually, these different rates are, I mean, corresponds to, are explained by the more or less homogeneous distribution of novels in manuscripts. Okay. okay. So, these studies are very interesting, I think, uh, for understanding the surviving Arthurian novels. And so they could, they could make it possible, for example, to reassess the importance of characters or adventures that seem secondary or minor to us today, but, because they, but which may reflect the influence of romances that are now lost. And the same kind of calculations or similar calculations were done in a recent book by Reveal Nets called Scale, Space and Canon in Ancient Literary uh, Culture. So he tried to imagine the number of lost writers, writers that, are, that wrote in, it's, it's a fundamental book, I mean, it's a very big book, one of the most important books written on ancient uh, and classical literature, and uh, very recent, and uh, a lot of hypotheses are made there and a lot of calculations, and it's very interesting. So I, you could uh, go to this, to this book. But I will give you a last example taken from my own book, uh, an example of indirect methods. You have that in the tomb of Oedipus. And it's about Greek tragedy. And um, so the question is this. We have preserved 32 complete Greek tragedies. So, seven by Aeschylus, but we know that he had written uh, 90 tragedies. Seven by Sophocles, but he had uh, 123. And 18, I was a bit more lucky, this one, uh, Euripides, uh, but we had, there were uh, 92 tragedies by Euripides. And we can calculate also that between the first tragedies we have saved, I mean, the Persians by Aeschylus in uh, 472, 
And the last tragedy, the most recent uh, tragedy we have, Oedipus in Colonus, it was in 4, 401, we can calculate that uh, 648 tragedies were performed at the biggest festival of tragedy in Athens, in the great Dionysia. But we know that there were other festivals in Athens, other festivals elsewhere, other tragedies were performed uh, elsewhere in Greece, and the history of tragedy is much longer than this small, uh, than this small period. So, actually, um, we have preserved, we can estimate, that we have preserved only one or two percent of the total of all the Greek tragedies written. So, what could we say about those tragedies that were lost? So, why, in other words, why have we kept these 32 tragedies and not the other ones? Actually, we have to look at how those tragedies came to us, and this is very important. Actually, 24 tragedies came to us from a school canon. It was a scholastic choice which stabilized around the second or third centuries of our era. And so there, there was already, the limitations to three main playwrights occurred, I mean, centuries before. But so those grammarians, uh, and it stabilizes in uh, papyri we have in manuscripts, uh, chose seven tra tragedies by Aeschylus, seven by Sophocles, and ten tragedies by Euripides for their students. And they chose them because they had some relationship with, uh, with the Iliad, with Homer, so it was more, they chose, it, chose them for pedagogical reason. But uh, here there are only 10, and those 24 tragedies came in Byzantine manuscripts with uh, all, all kinds of commentaries. So it's a very it's a long tradition. But there are some other tragedies by Euripides that come from another, I mean, completely other uh, source. They are called the alphabetical tragedies by uh, Euripides. So they appear, those eight tragedies, in two, only two manuscripts without commentaries. And they have that particularity that their titles follow each other in alphabetical order from Epsilon to uh, Iota. And actually these, so we call them alphabetical tragedies, actually they reproduce exactly, uh, we, we, have a, we have a list of uh, complete works of, tra of Euripides. And this section, this, uh, this uh, these, these tragedies, these eight tragedies, reproduce a continuous section in a list of alphabetical, I mean, in the list of the complete works by, by Euripides. Because in ancient times, I mean, works, complete works of an author were uh, ordered by the alphabetical, uh, according to the alphabetical uh, order. So why, have, why do we have those eight tragedies in two manuscripts? Actually, the hypothesis that was made, and it was, they came from a few rolls from a, taken from a complete edition uh, of Euripides, happened to be sometimes some, somewhere in Greece and were copied. And so they were copied in two manuscripts, and so we have those eight alphabetical uh, tragedies. So those tragedies can be considered Thus, as a result of a purely random draw from the Euripides corpus. They were not chosen. They were not chosen. They were just there by chance. They followed the alphabetical order. And thus, they represent a kind of a uh, sample, a statistical sample, a sample that is more statistically representative than the 10 other plays that were chosen by the grammarians. These were not chosen. They were just they happen to be there. So if they are more representative, so what, we can make some calculation about those, about those uh, tragedies. And let us, make, let us take the example of the endings of play. We know that the question of the endings of play was quite important for Aristotle. So let us look at the 
10 tragedies by Euripides that were transmitted by the school canon. We see that among them, eight have an unhappy ending and two have happy endings. And we know that Aristotle had that discussion because what's, what is better, a happy ending, unhappy ending? For him, it was unhappy ending. But we know, he's, he's, he tells us that as he, at, at his time, I mean, happy endings were preferred and he, he disagreed with it. But let us have now uh, um, uh, look at those alphabetical or random tragedies, as I call them. And so what we see is that among them, one only had an unhappy ending and seven had happy endings. So it's completely the uh, opposite. So the contrast is extremely striking and uh, it is unlikely to be due to chance alone. And when you look at fragments of tragedies and when you can infer endings by, uh, from these fragments, you, look, you see that 70% of fragments by Euripides, uh, I mean, of plays have happy endings for Euripides. And when you look at fragments, 50% of those lost plays by Sophocles, when you can reconstruct, it is not always possible, but when you can imagine the, the ending, 50% had unhappy ending or happy ending because it's the other way uh, around. So this changes a lot about our conception of what Greek tragedy was. So it means that there were a lot more uh, tragedies with happy endings than, than, were, than those that were transmitted to us. So the image we have from the canon for the 32 complete Greek tragedies is actually a false image in many ways. So that's with that's, that is my argument and that is an argument that I could, I mean, arrive at with that indirect method. So, in conclusion, and this is really my, my conclusion, we can see that the indirect method for evaluating the nature of a number of lost works gives astonishing results, even when nothing remains of the, of the lost, of those lost works. So, how can we arrive at such results? I think because we I mean, the researchers in medieval uh, romances and what I do or what uh, Reveal Nets uh, does, because we use the structure of the remaining corpus. And so we, we, we carefully analyze the structure of the corpus, and then we have some knowledge, partial knowledge, of the history of the constitution of the corpus we have. And thus, which that allows us to extrapolate the structure of the missing corpus. And so it can reveal, we can reveal a little of this dark matter of literature, which made us dream so much, these invisible works without which our visible works would not exist. So we must make the hypothesis of dark matter and enter our own mental libraries because the visible matter of literature needs this hypothesis. All literary works refer explicitly or implicitly to other works which we do not know, which we sometimes have lost any trace of. And in order to understand those visible works we are interested in, we need to make a research for those invisible works that fill the background of the universe of literature. This is an ethical as well as an epistemological imperative. And such imperative as we will see more closely in my next and last lecture about the World Library. Thank you for your attention.